To be a disciple means we're learning to be like Jesus, growing in his character while learning to do the things he could do, developing his competencies. It's about character and competency. To do this, we increasingly pattern our life after the life of Jesus. So one of the questions we have to ask is how Jesus would pattern his life if he had your job, if he had your personality type, your family situation, lived where you lived, or made the same amount of money that you make. When we examine the life of Jesus in the Gospels, what we see emerge is a particular way of relating to the world around him. He is very intentional in how he used his time to invest in certain kinds of relationships. It's the pattern of his whole life and ministry. Put another way, Jesus had three great loves that his entire life oriented around. In Mark 9, 2 through 29, we see Jesus go up a mountain to pray. But this wasn't abnormal for Jesus, was it? Throughout his life, he was constantly getting away from the crowds and everyone else to spend time with his first love, attending to the upward dimension of his life, his relationship with his Father. We then see him come down the mountain and run straight into the people he's investing his life into, his disciples. Jesus was never ambiguous about who his spiritual family was. In attending to the inward dimension of his life, Jesus spent more than 50% of his time with just his spiritual family and no one else. But then he steps out into the full brokenness of the world, driving out an evil spirit from a troubled boy. Jesus attends to the outward dimension by dealing with sin head on. He's concerned with how sin affects individuals, how each person is separated from God because of their sin and doomed because of it. And he's concerned that when you get a bunch of sinful people together, they create systems of sin and injustice. Sin creates individual problems and communal problems. Jesus stepped out and brought hope to both. Three great loves. He was deeply connected to his father. He was constantly investing in those his father had given him to disciple and to be spiritual family with and he entered into the brokenness of the world with good news and asked for a response individually and communally. To be disciples of Jesus, we pattern our life in the same way that Jesus did, up, in, and out. Most people are naturally good at one. They're okay at a second, and they're fairly bad at a third, but rather than simply playing to our strengths, we commit to be learners. The invitation of Jesus is to pattern our life after His, to learn His ways, and to let His power be made perfect in our weakness. But we also recognize that because a collection of Christians is the body of Jesus, we want the full expression of Jesus, not just parts of it, so that these three dimensions saturate community life as well. Whether it's a group of eight people or a group of 8,000, when a group of people is committed to truly being the body of Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins stoking the fires of a red-hot center by which people can't help but be drawn into the warmth of. When we have a spiritual family learning to live into up, in, and out in a communal way, people the Lord has prepared can't help but be drawn in because this community is the gospel made visible. As we think about this, the way Jesus lived as opposed to just the things he said and the works that he did, but the way he lived his life as our model. Um, when I was thinking about this, uh, I heard Ian uh, share a message at Andrew Broadbent, who some of you know, at his ordination. And I said to Ian, please come and share that at Billabong because that would be a great contribution to um, this, this theme. And so Ian's going to share today from uh, Luke 4, and I'll let him introduce that. And So, yeah. So thanks for coming in. Can I pray for you before you speak? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, bringing Ian to us today, and I pray that as he speaks, you would guide and lead the words of his mouth and that your Holy Spirit would speak through him and that you would open all our ears and hearts to hear um, not only the words of Scripture um, but the words of your Holy Spirit, that we may be obedient to your word as we consider what you're saying to us and what you're calling us to do in response. Um, so we pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for having me. If you were at Andrew uh, Broadband's ordination, you've heard all of this already. 
and you can go to sleep or you can pray. I'm not quite sure. See if, we, see if we can improve on that. I've got a story for you. It comes from Luke chapter 4. It's about Jesus. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country and he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. It's from chapter 49 of Isaiah, if you want to check it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And then he rolled up that scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, which is beginning to preach in those times. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the story goes on. Um, you, you can read it yourself. So come and stand with me. This next slide. Uh, and, and see what I can see in these gospel readings. We're going to the village of Nazareth. And it's a tiny first century village. It's not even as big as this picture. And there's the limestone walls and the flat roofs. Maybe you can imagine a few stalwart donkeys with flies in their ears and their lead dragging the ground. Market gardens are scattered around the hills. And there, zooming in, you can see a bunch of believers are waiting in, uh, for a quorum that will turn their village square into the village synagogue. They didn't have uh, hardly any uh, synagogue buildings in those days. People just used to gather. And then they had uh, to get the, you know, like the mics and the, you know, the, the sound gear and so on that we have, they had a, a kind of like a big wheelbarrow they called the Ark of the Torah and out of that would come the biblical scrolls. And that's been rolled out into the square. Can you see that man over there by the almond tree who's just joined the waiting? And that's his family over there. Mary and her lot. I don't know about those strangers with him. There's something about him, isn't there? His eyes are bright, but he's very thin. A bit, a bit ragged even. Hang on. That looks like Yeshua, Mary's oldest boy. He used to run his dad's building business here. But he left town quite a while ago. So he's come back again. Mary will be pleased. Let's slide. The synagogue ruler starts proceedings and Yeshua has been asked to read. Very appropriate. Favourite son has returned from God knows where and what's he going to read? Well, he read what we just said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. I wonder if you realise what you've just heard. The people who were there had the same problem we have with this text. They hear Isaiah 49 and they think it's ancient history. But Jesus says it is today. Today, Jesus says, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The life of faith is no longer a long hope off in the future direction. It's no longer an ideology, if only we could practice it properly. The life of faith is no longer an impossible dream, it is today. 
The kingdom of God is today or it's nothing. Today or nothing. And Jesus has read the agenda for the kingdom of God. All those bullet points. Spirit upon me, good news to the poor, release to the captives and so on. That's the agenda. Those are all the items that you look for to see. Are we doing the kingdom of God today? Is that what we're doing? Is that what it looks like when you read our order of service? Is that what it looks like when we have a meeting? Is that what it looks like when I post on Facebook? I wonder if what Jesus read describes your week. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Next slide. Where does Jesus get this incredible sense of assurance from? Here he is reading from Isaiah from 500 years before and he says, yep, that's it, here we go, time's up. All that God has promised through all of the history and all of the exile. First gear, off we go. Well, this young man has just spent 40 days and more in the desert of the northern Aravar region. Jesus has probably just endured the most rigorous possible act of spiritual discernment. He's trying to figure out how you do God's will today. How does he do what he has to do? How do you launch the kingdom of God so it sticks and reaches into all the world? Well, you can read the first part of Matthew, Mark and Luke and you'll, you'll see how difficult it was. But Luke 4 records he has just come out of that desert where he was held, marinated in the love of God. Jesus experienced God's love in ways that we can barely sniff at from time to time. And it's in that incredible holding love and acting missional love that he now speaks. From 40 days of prayer and fasting, he's probably lost one third of his body weight. No wonder he looks ragged. He's been discerning the difference between God's voice and Satan's voice. He's discerned power plays from service. He's sifted PR from proclamation of the faith. He sifted welfare provision from healing. He sifted a church agenda from the kingdom of God. Forty days and nights, a third of his body weight. Do you sift your agenda like that? Do you think you can manage more easily than Jesus did? Or do you think this whole kingdom of God thing is impossible anyway, so why even try? Well, I suspect that's probably what we think. And the synagogue is just like church. Jesus stood up like he'd stand up in church. But Luke says he stood up in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this passage of Scripture is the crux of future church. This is it. This is it. <laughs> this is our agenda. This is what it looks like when you live under the love of God. When you live for the reign of God in a contested world and a contested church. It's interesting, next slide, that as Jesus read out the kingdom agenda, he finished that old text. And in, in Isaiah 49, it goes on to urge that, you, that, that God would take revenge upon their enemies. And Jesus misses that out. I tell you, that really irritated people, like it does today. They didn't miss the omission. We would like him not to omit that verse. Anyway, no wonder they were proud of him and confused by him. Okay, so what have we just heard? 
I don't want to concentrate on any one of those items. Um, you can read books about that and uh, get your head around it. But I want to give the big picture here, this crux matter. Coming from the most disciplined desert discernment, in the fullness of the Spirit, the gospel of the Son of God is the single clearest lens by which to read the entire Bible and act upon it. These verses are the single clearest lens by which to understand the entire Bible and then act upon it. If you read Deuteronomy, you don't know these verses, you're getting Deuteronomy wrong. You read Paul's epistles and you don't know these verses, you're getting Paul wrong. You understand? The agenda of the church is not to have musically wonderful services. It's not on the list. It's not to have liturgically correct Eucharists and ordinations. We're not to have pretty meetings with tailored words, ancient histories with philosophical critique, powerless, endless meetings. We're not to have progressive speculations sparring with conservative ethics. The agenda is not the security of our institution organised around a hierarchy of clergy like me and councils and so on. I hope you're withering so far. <laughs> I hope I've upset at least half of you by now because that is exactly what our agenda looks like most of the time. All the stuff that's not on the list. <laughs> like it has a place. It has some importance. But it's not it. It's not the agenda of the kingdom. These ways that we follow so easily, so attractively, are wrong and do wrong. They result in people being hurt. And lost. We simply have to exercise discernment. We have to sift the agenda, our own personal agenda first. We have to change. We have to reject the terribly interesting but false influences that are all basically just luxuries. Jesus would later say to his followers, Beware of the influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I reckon, because we are not wary, because we don't discern well or enough, we have been sucked in by both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You can read up about those two for yourself. Here is the agenda. Have we been spirit-led and spirit-filled? Are we following good ideas that are not God ideas? Or, you know, I'm chaplain at the university. Are we proud of our minds? <laughs> or the new one, the new one. Are we proud of our passions? That's not on the list either. Like, it has a place. Or, are we being desert formed? Are we discomforted from the importance of our wealth? Do we go to conflict places in order to be peacemakers? Are we assured of our calling and then throwing our whole self at it? Or are we just another organisation? Did we share the good news of Jesus this week? Have we done some work to remove the obstacles that stop us or silence us? Have we addressed the, free, the fears about that that cause us to be God's frozen people? 
are we tackling and learning to tackle the way the public media drowns our good news in, to put it politely, compost? There's stuff to be learned here. Some inner work to be done. Did we hang out with the poor? Are we becoming one with them? Or did we merely consult on the issues, talk about marginalisation and read books on best practice? Has activism been seduced by clicktivism? Did we go down to the jail to visit the broken? Do we make a nuisance of ourselves in the face of the officials, maybe in your underwear? Against the bias in our commerce and in our culture, how can we relocate ourselves to be near the social scrap heap of these towns of ours? No wonder Jesus says, go into all the world. <laughs> you have to relocate. We've got to go find the blind and lame and disabled and the different and make sure, and make sure that they know in their raw vulnerability, that they have a place and a purpose among us. Make sure they know that. Or do we, you know, as I have done, you know, driven by, too scared to stop? Friends, uh, th those of us who are doing okay, and I know we're not all doing fantastic, those of us who are doing more or less okay just don't realise how oppressed other people can be. How quickly the tide of oppression is rising now. Therefore, those of us who work hard to be like everyone else around us don't realise how nasty we are when we remain silent with the volume up in our shiny privileges. That's why Jesus says, go. Go looking, connect, live, create, build with them a gospel community and, and live the Jesus way. Friends, this is not left wing or right wing, this is just forwards. <laughs> forwards into all the world. No wonder Jesus says, I send you out. I send you out. Go into all the world and pre preach the gospel to all peoples. This is what he's saying. Go do that. Go do that. The next slide. So what do I mean about today? Well, I've just said this scripture is the single clearest lens by which to read the actions of any group or ourselves or any scripture. Hence the, the glasses. You can't read it without this the beauty of this agenda is you can actually know whether you do it or not. <laughs> it's like on a job description, they say, you know, at the end of the year, we want to know whether you've done this. They call them KPIs or, you know, key position indicators or key progress indicators, depending on how nice your manager is. And so on our church AGM, this is the, uh, this is the agenda. On Friday night, when we sit down and think about our week, this is the agenda. That's what I mean. You can know whether you're doing it or not. The other thing about this agenda is that it's a warning. Because there are other people who want other agendas. And you will find that if you insist on living for the kingdom, there are some people who are gonna, whose budgies are going to get very frightened. Jesus speaks about the blessed conflict of those who follow him. Blessed are you when, when all kinds of people persecute you. He says, this is typical. Happened to Isaiah. No wonder he's reading from Isaiah. <laughs> and so on. Remember this, though. In the painful contest of ideas, as Desmond Tutu said, and he should know, this is the winning side to follow any other agenda is to be 
a loser. The agenda of the kingdom of God. Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Imagine a city called hell with gates that are supposed to keep you out. (laughs) And he says, when we go about doing love like this, nothing stops us. The love of God gets in, you know, where angels fear to tread. (laughs) We go there not knowing what will happen. And God shows up. We go where things seem impossible. The gates of hell even will not prevail against us. The other thing about this agenda is that it's not too heavy. Each of us plays a part, one part in it. I don't know whether you're more like a healing person or more like a proclamation person or whether you're like someone who kind of like get beside the poor or someone who likes to um, uh, find, find what the issues are and find the people affected and bring about their liberation. I don't know. But all those are parts of Jesus' work. You're not being asked to become a hero you just ask to become part of this magnificent movement. There. We're all sent out into all the world with a gospel to proclaim and to live accordingly on this agenda. How do we start? Uh, by simply starting. Doing something, somewhere, somehow, anyhow, anywhere, with whoever and whenever the Spirit of God prompts you. I hope that's specific enough. (laughs) The other thing that's true about this is you never have the time and you never have the money. Always true about the things that God is saying, do this. It's called forwards. Well, I hope standing next to me in Nazareth on this day, I hope you're all suitably upset. If Jesus in the fullness of God, if Jesus is the fullness of God, who in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit says from the book of Isaiah that this is our job description, then how can we not make sure that our meeting agenda looks like it? And our diary looks like this. And our Christmas newsletter reports on this. And our radio interviews and our Facebook posts. I'd probably not count Twitter feeds because they don't look like anything. Let me just uh, continue with this analogy as we come towards a finish. If you don't have this lens, this Luke 4 lens then life is not in focus. Ah. And your church is not in focus, and therefore you don't know the way. Similarly, it may be true that if you don't know the way, you don't have the lens. You're putting it together some other way. No, friends, return to this simple lifestyle description. My burns burn with hope these days at what the Jesus movement can achieve now. Most parts of our society, if you point it out to them, are starting to realise What happens when you walk away from the Jesus movement? The selfishness, the power plays, the liberties, the the, the putting of people down, the wasting of people's lives, the accumulation of wealth amongst some to the detriment of the many, and so on, and so on, and so on. We used to be held together by Christian values. We used to be held together by Jesus. That's long gone. 
then we live together off the heritage of Christianity and now that's going. It doesn't last. People are now realising something's wrong. And the church is realising something's wrong. We have pursued other constructions. We've had our own ideas. We've had boxes into which God would fit. And we've had institutions that we tried to build. And all that other, all that other stuff that I said early on is not the agenda, has been the agenda. And finally, the churches are starting to figure it out. That packing 5,000 hand raises into a room with, with noise that will crush your eardrums is not exactly the outcome Jesus had in mind. Uh, someone in trouble. Okay. In the sad and sandy slippage <coughs> of the mainstream churches, it is exciting to be alive right now because the only way to go is up. After death comes resurrection. And that is a fun roller coaster. It is not sweet and tame. <laughs> that road to Emmaus story, all the other stories of Jesus after the resurrection, which we're soon coming to at Easter, all that chaos, that will be our church. All that coming to new life stuff, that will be our church. Don't, don't, don't ask for sweet and organised and predictable. That's the broad way that leads to destruction. <laughs> it's going to be a roller coaster. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> and the spirit will be here in some new and wonderful Aussie way. Among all the things we cannot know and we cannot do and we cannot understand... And all the things that we feel frustrated by, our leadership and our servanthood in our community, is that today we are the community where Jesus reigns. Nowhere else. Nobody else. Jesus thought it was enough to start with 12 only. And one of them was a lemon. <coughs> And you're at least three times uh, better off this morning. But none of you are lemons. <laughs> <coughs> Friends, we have tried to be church. But our clear calling is to be Jesus. Let me say it again. This is revolutionary. We have tried to be the church but our clear calling is to be Jesus me broken as I am yes that's why the Holy Spirit is given it's not about you just be Jesus truly deeply simply and clearly this Nazareth synagogue has told us how. Well, friends, if you've been standing next to me and peering over Nazareth's back fence, and if you've heard this word of the gospel in, as it's lived out, and if you're someone who wants to push aside all the other edifices and constructions and all the other agenda of church as institution, I wonder if you would Stand with me to pray a prayer I'm going to put up here. And if you've never prayed a prayer like this before, you can come and see me afterwards for some uh, post-operative care. Will you stand with me and say this uh, prayer, if you dare, <coughs> together? You'll know it's when it's finished because it has our men at the end. So together. Lord Jesus Christ, Send us out today in the power of the Spirit to fulfill our part in your agenda. In every today, please throw us open and over whenever and wherever we construct some other edifice of heart. 
in the love and the way and the beauty of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Let me bring my prayer to you, and then Luke can come and rescue you from me. Lord, I, I know I have sometimes built an image of church or pulled one in from some other place or some other time, but it's not your agenda, and it's not here, and it's not now. I repent of my sin, of taming the gospel, of boxing you in. And as I wait upon you now, I lift my head to hear your call and will obey. Amen. One thing you may have noticed about the prayer on the screen, the pray if you dare, was that it was us, our, we, together, not me, I, my, alone. And hopefully you've been putting that together in everything we've been speaking about, that this is us together, yes, as individuals, but we can only be Jesus together because none of us are Jesus. <laughs> um, and so um, hopefully we can go on this journey together at what it means to reach out.